Hey, everybody. This is Carter. Welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series between writers. Always a good time. Um, and I don't know when this particular episode is going to, going to be posted, uh, but I will tell you in a week from now, I am getting a puppy. That's right. You heard me. I'm getting a goddamn dog. Uh, it's been about five years since I've had a dog. And of course, I have Guff, my psychopathic uh, cat. Um, but I decided it was time. And so um, and it's a surprise to the kids. So next week, we're going to go pick her up. We're getting a little a little girl golden retriever. Everybody go, oh, she's going to be so cute. Um, but anyway, in subsequent episodes, if it just sounds like all hell is breaking loose in the background, that's why. And that's probably just how it will be uh, for the rest of my life. Anyway, let's talk about the show because I had a fantastic guest on today. Today I had on Nuzo Ono. Um, she's a Nigerian British writer uh, and she's a pioneer of the African horror literary subgenre. She's actually been coined the queen of of African horror and how cool of a title is that? Um, she's fascinating and her background is, is, is equally fascinating. Um, you know, she grew up in what's now Nigeria during a time as a little, little girl from five to eight when there was a war. So she went through war as a child and, um, and it was interesting to hear about how all those memories have kind of, unleash themselves, you know, in her writing one way or another, um, and how she was pulled to writing, uh, whether she wanted to, to be a writer or not. It just is one of those things. I think we hear that with a lot of different guests. It's like, it comes out. If you're a writer, it's going to come out one way or another. Um, and it was, it was, and it was fascinating to hear her talk about her actual process of writing, which she describes as a possession. Like it just comes and it might not even be the story she's working on. Just something comes and she's like, all right, there's 20 hours of my day now. And she just goes and writes and gets this story out. Um, it's almost like an exorcism. <laughs> so, um, and, 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 you know, if, if she doesn't finish the story, that story just goes unfinished because maybe that, that possession stopped before the story was, was finished. So it was really interesting talking to her about that. And then also balancing kind of that style with writing with also, you know, having been trained, she had her master's degree in writing, having been trained in, in what she called in, in Western writing. Cause it was, it was in the UK. Um, you know, are there any conflicts between that? Um, so she was really a super engaging person to talk to and her storytelling abilities at the end are wonderful. Um, and I should mention her new book, which looks fantastic is called a dance for the dead. Um, so please, please, please check that out. Um, and I think you're really going to like this one. She, um, uh, you know, we just clicked. I, I, I really liked her and I was just, I was kind of hanging on her every word. So uh, this is my conversation with Nuzo Ono. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Hello, Carter. We are, we are now connected. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you? I'm doing very well. So it's uh, just about evening there, right? It is evening, seven o'clock. Okay. Where? So where are you exactly? In the West Midlands, and United tell, Kingdom. So tell me where that is in the UK, more or less. It's, we are bang in the middle. We are landlocked. We don't seem to have any seas or the ocean around us. So when oh, we want to go to the seaside, we travel out. Good thing we don't get floods. So. <laughs> you're you're the one place in the UK that doesn't get flooded. Guaranteed, exactly. So there is an advantage to not living by the seaside. Yes, I, I I'm exactly the same in just a larger country. I'm right in the middle. I'm in Colorado, so I'm up in the mountains. So no, we we get different things. We get fires, but no no floods. No floods, exactly. <laughs> so you know where I'm coming from. <laughs> so did you uh did you grow up there? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Nigeria, in, in Nigeria. old Biafra, in old Biafra. In those days, um, we were fighting to have our own country separate from Nigeria. So um, unfortunately, we lost the war. So we're now part of Nigeria. So yeah, but I always say I grew up in old Biafra. Okay, okay. And then was that, was that conflict when you were a child? 
yes, I was a child. It started, um, I was uh, five, five years old when it started. And by the time it ended, I was eight. Uh, yeah. Wow. So, and you, um, and I assume you have very distinct memories of that. Oh, God, very vivid. One thing I always say is every Biafran child, in fact, had an opportunity to talk to a, a friend who just wrote a book about the children in Biafra. And one thing you'll find is every child that grew up in Biafra, it, it took away our childhood from us. And you grew up very quickly because it was a, a vicious war. It was wow. a vicious war. So I mean, the memories stay with you. Well, yeah, when you think... When when I think about those specific ages, five to eight, right? That is yeah. so so impressionable. So formative, yeah, yeah. formative years. I you mean, know, but it's the same thing anywhere there is a battle, anywhere there's a war. Children in Syria, all over the place, Ukraine, sure. the children live through it, and the adults don't realize that the children they take in things. You know, you think they are children, and they are not. Um, they don't understand what's happening. We do. We do. We just process it in our own ways. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think psychologists have very much found that, you know, there's a lot of things that that, you know, even kids might not they, they're processing it, but they might not even be aware of the processing it. But, you know, 30, 40 years later, those are the years that will come out. Those are the years where something happened that yeah. in, informs who you become as a person. Right. Exactly. Exactly, because I found the same thing. Um, I didn't even realize how I knew I was impacted by the war. Um, because after the war, I knew that I developed this terror of planes. Huh. Um, I would see a plane, I would hear a plane, I would dive under the bed instantly just to hide because that was the um, a standard thing we did during the war. You hear a plane, if you're inside the house, dive under the bed. Or uh, if you're outside, stand still, stand close to a tree so they don't know you're a child, they'll think you're the tree. And I knew my fear of planes developed as a child mm. and my insomnia developed also as a child. I mean, up till now, I still suffer terrible insomnia, but I wasn't linking it so much. It's only as I grew older, the more the older I got, the more things that happened kept shrieking in, you know. Yeah. And then I found writing the book was the easiest way to sort of uh, exercise a lot it's, of things. It's, it's therapeutic. Yeah, it's funny. I've, you know, and I'm interested to know kind of your 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 journey, but of all the writers that I talk to, and myself included, there's, you know, there is this link of writing as as self therapy, right? For sure, it's it's meditative. It's forcing you to be um, present, and it's also forcing you to kind of think about things that that you're not actively normally thinking about. You're bringing up things from your past through through fiction, through characters that you might not even be aware of. I, I see that with me all the time. I'll see, I'll write about something. I'm like, why did I write about that? I'm like, oh, because yeah. isn't that weird? It is a subconscious thing. You don't even realize you're doing it. And you're putting in all these things into your characters, into the scenes, everything. And it's only maybe later on when you read it, it dawns on you. Ah, there's this correlation with my right. life and the character, right. you know, and you suddenly realize, okay, but when you're doing it, you don't realize you're doing it. Or even what you like the type of book that you write, because I get asked and, and, and I want to discuss it with you a little bit. You know, I get asked like, why, you know, why do you write dark thrillers? Why so dark? I'm like, I don't know why <laughs> it, it's just interesting to me. I don't have this and I don't know, you know, I didn't have war in my childhood, but I'm just drawn. You didn't have a it. psychopath in your childhood. I, I, but <laughs> maybe I did. And I haven't, I haven't uh, unleashed that uh, repressed memory yet. <laughs> But it's just like, it's just something in my psyche wants to go in that direction. So now, so before we get into discussing horror, so when did you, when did you leave Africa? Um, I left uh, Nigeria when I was 17. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I so the war was, was done for several years. So you stayed and then you, yes. and then you left or your entire family left? Oh, no, no, no. Everybody. My dad was a British trained lawyer. Okay. So being a, a product of uh, colonialism and the colonial mentality, he had this thing that all the only good education in the world was a British education huh. and the only good provider had to be Quakers. 
So he started sending everybody to Quaker boarding schools. Huh. So my little sisters and my brother and my sister, everybody was already in Quaker schools. And then I it put me into another Quaker boarding school as well. So it was a thing with him that all his children had to get British education. Okay. And then, so he just started sending everybody off to study in England. And, That's a, and so you had, you obviously have, siblings were they are you, were they older so had had you witnessed like you know a sibling go away and and see what that was like for them before you went <laughs> yourself <laughs> my my older sister and my older brother my younger sister had all gone already oh, okay. and they were all there so it was like just going to join family i knew i wasn't going to be alone in the boarding school i was in my younger sister was already in the boarding school oh same and my school older- okay Yes, in the same school. And my right. other sister was in a sister boarding school, just a few towns away from me. So it was like having the whole family around. It, yeah. it didn't. Yeah. Okay. We just we flew back to Nigeria for Christmas and holidays, but otherwise, yeah. Okay. And so and um so that was for boarding school. And then did you stay in the UK for, for education after that? I- yeah, I did my A-levels, finished my A-levels and went to university, Warwick University, got my first degree, went back to Warwick, did my master's degree later on in writing. Uh, in between that, had two marriages and two divorces, <laughs> lived in lived in Switzerland with the first husband. <laughs> wow, we've got, a, we've got a lot to unpack here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Wait, but you uh, studied law initially, right? Yeah, my dad, I said to you, my dad was a, a the, the family, it's a family of uh, lawyers, his ah, okay. brother, even my first husband was a lawyer, his father was a lawyer, you know, it's a, something with a legal thing, my father decided what you do, I wanted to be a musician, you know, uh, from a teen, my teenage years, I was running wild with bands and everything, singing, mm-hmm. playing the guitar and everything. Your father my probably dad didn't like didn't that so much. <laughs> no, no, so... When my first sister died in the plane crash, she was also a lawyer. My Mm. father decided, right, you're the second uh, sister, the second oldest sister. Off you go do law, whether you like it or not. I didn't want to. I resisted. Mm. But um, they said to me, listen, he doesn't care. He's already done everything. It's your future. If you don't do law, you end up having no education. Nobody pays for your education and you become a bum. So Hmm. Just go in and do it, you know. So, but it sounds like you grew up with probably a very heavy roots of creativity. If if you were, you know, looking at the music, and then obviously, you know, you <laughs> you became a writer. So, and that's, you know, I think no matter what, like if you're a writer, that's going to come out <laughs> at some point. It in will come out. It no matter how you hard around. you try to study law or do something else, it comes out, and I see it time and time again. It's it's amazing to me. Like you just can't. you have to express yourself in a certain way and and you know whether you're successful doing or not people still become writers it doesn't matter it once you have the bug it's in your dna it doesn't leave you it doesn't leave you and and especially once you write that first book and you're like oh i love to tell stories i didn't realize that but now yeah, yeah you like i can't ever envision like well i'm going to retire from writing at certain age like i can't it doesn't even feel like that would ever be an option because I just because it doesn't feel like a job. Uh, sometimes I've thought about that in recent times during the lockdown. I said to myself, I'm not going to write anymore. Oh. I, I'm done with writing. Why? I just don't want, you know, it was everything was so dire. Everything yeah. was so dark. Everything was so uh it, it, it's during the lockdown you realize the Buddhist teaching about the transiency of life. When Buddhism says to you, you know, life is so transient, nothing is permanent. And during the lockdown, you realize, oh my gosh, from one day your reality can change, just switch like that. And there was no motivation. It was the the situation was so dark that as a horror writer, I didn't want to write dark things. I didn't want to write horror. I didn't want to watch horror. In fact, since the lockdown, I've stopped watching horror films. The last film I watched was uh, uh what was a the Parasite. Parasites, yes, the right. Korean film. Uh, that was the a, last horror it's film. Amazing I film. Watched. Yeah. Yeah. But and that yeah. was just at the beginning, 2020. So. <laughs> and is that just because, is it because I find that fascinating because I'm a little bit the same way as like, I can write 
way darker stuff than I can watch or even yeah. read. Uh, like, cause sometimes like, I don't want to go there in my head, but somehow when I write it, it's, it never seems as dark as what then people tell me it is. <laughs> like, you oh, know, I thought that was yeah, happy. You say this, you've made my day <laughs> because sometimes I say to myself, you're a bloody fraud. Sorry for the swearing. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> swearing encouraged <laughs> on this show. <laughs> Sometimes I say to myself, listen, you're a fraud. You know, you can't watch horror films. You don't like reading horror books. You're so frightened of everything. And yet you go write horror books and you write these horrible, dark things. And yet to be a, a real horror writer, surely you must love watching horror films and reading horror books and basically marinating in everything horror. But yeah, I don't, hearing yeah. you say that is like, yeah. It's true else. though, right? Because again, your process, you know, it sounds like through your horror writing, you are processing. I mean, it's like having nightmares. Like I don't want to have nightmares in the middle of the night, but yes. my, that's just where my brain goes. I wouldn't, so I don't want to watch horror movies, but if my brain goes dark when I'm writing, that's just my expression of creativity and me getting something out, you know? So do you find you have nightmares as well? Do you have horror dreams? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> since a little kid. Yeah, totally. I have very bizarre dreams. I never have, I never dream about people I know or situations. It's always bizarre. And it's usually, or very often it's very horrible. It's very like violent. And I don't know where that comes from, but it's just, what about you? Well, listening to you is so strange. Do you know you must be the number the fourth horror writer I've spoken to that says they have far out nightmares, huh. psychedelic, crazy, out of this world dreams. And yeah. they've always had it from childhood, just like me. Hmm. And I'm wondering, is that something, is there a connection between our proclivity for nightmares from childhood and our horror writing? You know, in your case, you said it's quite violent and yeah. you write thrillers, yeah. pretty. So I'm wondering, is there a link between People that grow up having nightmares and end up writing such dark stories. I mean, I guess it's all, no matter what, in a very active imagination, whether it's conscious or subconscious. Yeah, but yeah, and I don't know about the the the, the relationship with the violence, but but I think there probably is something there, right? Like, if yeah. if, if I <laughs> if I I wonder if I had like sex dreams all the time, I'd be writing romance. I don't know. <laughs> I, we should talk Why? to some rom romance authors and see what they they, <laughs> they dream about. That's a good one, actually. That's a good one. Yeah. What do you dream about when you write those books? <laughs> yeah, but so, honestly, seriously, I, I find the dreams uh, such precursors to what I write because many times what I write come from my dreams. And I find oh, okay. a lot of horror writers say exactly the same thing, that they get inspiration from dreams. My nightmares used to be my enemy till I realized I could harness them. You know, I have a diary, my dream. Well, I've got loads of diaries. I have diaries for, you know, my plans and my goals. I have diaries for dreams. I have, mm -hmm. I have diaries for good things, only happy good things in my diary. And I have diaries for illness. So any symptom, I'm a, probably a ah. hypochondriac somewhere. <laughs> so these are like yeah. physically separate diaries. Yeah. So you just separate have a bunch diaries. of them and you pull down, this yeah. is my, what I had to eat today diary. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now wow. you're talking. Wow. Yeah. So my dream diary, sometimes I pull them out. As soon as I have a dream that's a nightmare or somebody tells me, my daughter tells me about her dreams and it's really horrible. I write it in the dream book because I know sooner or later I'm going to find inspiration in those dreams. Oh, that's interesting. So you go back it through it It doesn't have to be just all. your dream. Yeah. yeah. And you, you go back through it. It's like, oh, that could be. An yeah. interesting idea for a story. Yeah. In my huh. in my in my story short story collection, The Reluctant Dead, and um, one of the stories there was straight out of my dream, you know, Night Flyer. I remember dreaming it and saying waking up and saying, This is horrible. Where did this come from? And when I was writing the book, it was just pouring out. It, it, the, that story wrote itself completely. Huh. So yeah. It's almost um, like if you had kept dreaming, it would have that whole story would have come come out. It's wow. just that we can never capture what we dream as accurately when we write it down. It's never really, yeah. 
Right. Yeah. Right. So you, so you got your law, just going back. So you got your law degree, but then you went back for your master's and that was in, in, in writing. Yeah. Where, where did, so something kind of self-actualized where you're like, yeah. okay, this is my journey and I'm going to pursue it. Do you remember like that happening or was it just always a uh, nudging feeling? No, because I, I was always writing, even from the age of 12. I remember I wrote a short story when I was 12. And I remember I formed a club called the Club of Young Writers uh, oh. in school, the boarding school I was in at that time in Nigeria. And we used to write stories. Well, we tried to write stories. But then I pushed all that away. And then when my father died, it was like a psychological freedom. I can do anything and I was looking at 50 50 was staring me in the face and I said I'm almost 50 and I haven't realized my dream um I've in in the meantime I've abandoned my dream to be a musician I've gone into marriage gotten divorced married again divorced and what are the dreams I haven't realized and the writing because as you say once a writer because even in the years in between I just kept writing little little stories here and there doing nothing with them just writing for the joy of writing right and then when my father died and I was hitting 50 I said no I have to do something for me me I'm not going to enter 50 without having achieved something for myself so i reapplied to Warwick University and Maureen Freely, she is the head of the writing uh, department, an American lady, beautiful. And she uh, called me in for an interview, looked at samples of my writing and said to me, you're in. And it was like, wow, I was the second oldest in the class. <laughs> and um, it was like a freedom, this light, this light bulb moment. And once I graduated, they did tell us it wasn't going to be an easy journey, you mm -hmm. know, especially um, with, with the genre I, was, genre I was writing. I wasn't sure. When I started, I wasn't writing African horror. I was sort of exploring everything. And then one day in class, Maureen said to us, just write something, write something from the heart, write something from your heart. No theme, nothing. And I wrote this little story and it was based in Africa. And the whole class, when I read it, it was like, I've never seen such a reaction. It was a spontaneous. And Maureen said to me, you found your voice, finally. She said to me, finally, you have found your voice. I never forgot that day. And it was like, wow, okay, this is what I can write. And when I started writing, I realized I was going back to my early childhood, the roots I had, the tales by moonlight we listened to as children during the war which were all inevitably ghost stories or stories of witches and wizards and evil stepmothers and transmogrifications, hmm. you know. And I, I just found I was right. I was remembering those stories, those folklore. But then I was merging the main in between. I've read who hasn't read the Stephen Kings of this world and merging in all these stories. And uh, that's that's it. I realized, okay, this is my calling. It came easily. I didn't have to do any research. The right. stories just flowed. Right. You know? Right. And that's so interesting when you kind of hit your stride and feel like that's what you want to write about. But what you're writing about is obviously, you know, dark stuff. And like you even said, during 2020, you were kind of questioning like if, if it was something that you even wanted to do. And I, I'm always wondering if there's a difference between finding your voice and also finding joy, you know? So in your case, like your voice is rooted in, in, in horror, but do you find when you're writing art, is it, is it a joyful experience for you? Do you enjoy uh, the subject matter or you just feel like this is what I have to write? Cause this is, I, I have no choice. This is what my, my, my mind is telling me to do. I call it a possession. I call it <laughs> exactly, exactly. Possession. Because when I start writing, when it comes, like I say, I can, my family, they know I can sit down for a whole week. I won't even remember to eat. I'm just oh, sitting wow. there. I can write for 20 hours a day. I'm like, I'm possessed. I'm just writing, 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 writing nonstop. The story just flows. Everything is flowing. I'm writing it. I don't do plotting. I don't do structures. All these things like J.K. Rowling that has color. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. 
I don't. I just say to the characters when they speak to me, put it all down. And yeah. so I'll be typing, typing till I'm totally drained. And then I get up wherever the story stops. That's where I leave it when I get up and I don't go back to it. I just take a break and I wait to hear the voices again. And sometimes when I do that, I can finish a story, a novel in a week. Other times it can take me a whole year. It just wow. depends. But it is a possession because many times I read what I've written and I say to myself, did I write that? But what I also find, and this is a big confession I'm making, once I write that book, I forget it. You're done. And so when, when yeah. people, whenever I have interviews, I panic. That's why I always say to people, give me questions. Because I find that I've forgotten everything I've written. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. But when they're asking me about this character, or this, I'm saying, what is that? What did they do? I'm the same way. Me, yeah. Maybe not as bad as it you. happened but to you. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like if they ask one of my earlier books and they'll mention a name, I'm like, who, who is that? Ooh. And then I'll remember, but like, yeah, I don't, I don't ever go back and re read my books. I don't ever no. look at my books. It, you know, I don't. So. Once yeah. it's done, it's done. That's why I say it's like a possession. You sort of have to exercise everything in the, release it, remove it, put it down in that book and it's over. You don't want to read it. You don't want to see it. And so when the, the editors tell you to go and ed the publishers tell you to edit, do this, it's the worst thing for me because that means I'm going back to that story. Right. I hate it. Right. Totally. Because you, I, I find when you write, when I write, you know, and I don't outline or anything either. So I never know where the story's going, but I, I fall massively in love. It, you know, it's like a relationship. I fall massively in love with this story for the, about the first hundred pages because it's exciting and it's new and it's fresh. And then as it wears on, I get a little tired of it. And by the end, I'm like, I don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like I don't I don't love you anymore. It's not you, it's me. And then you make and it sound you, like a relationship. It is. And then you move on to the next one and you find a new love all over again. And then your editor says, No, we got to go back to the to, to your ex and, and deal with this. And I'm like, oh, but I don't want to. <laughs> do you was, know what I do what? in those middle stages that that time when you talk about the middle of it? One thing I find is that short stories. It's like amazing. Hmm. When you go past that first initial flow of everything flowing and you've put down the rush, it's all down there. And when you find the middle bit dragging, that's when you find me going to watch a film or I get short stories. And I like short stories from different countries, different cultures, because somehow you can read a short story in one hour. You know, you just. So, yeah. So it, it, it just it's. It's almost like exciting your brain to yeah. see things yeah. in a different, but you don't ever, because sometimes I feel like reading fiction is, is hard for me when I'm really in the middle of writing. Cause I, you know, ah. I'm either critical of it or I, I don't want to adopt their voice by mistake, you know, or if it's particularly good, you know, so sometimes that's a little bit of a struggle for me. Ah, right. I think because probably because of the kind of horror I write, I don't worry about adopting anybody's voice because yeah. I can only write it in the voice I write it in. Um, but, but I just find when I read short stories, it's it's like an infusion of, you know, literary cocaine. Uh, yeah. Your brain just goes, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. and or you go watch a film or you just do something different, completely nothing to do with writing. And when you come back, you're like, va -va -voom. you're ready to go. Yeah. You're slaying it again. Yeah. Your, your description of it as a possession is, is, is intriguing. Um, because, you know, the, the sense that I'm getting is that you're not really even in control. It's like, this story is coming out and <laughs> come hell or high water is coming out. But then, you know, but yet you have also this training, this schooling and knowledge about structure and arc and all yeah. that kind of stuff. How yeah. do you, how do you reconcile those two things? Because if it's just, if you're just like pouring out the story, that story might not be structurally a good story. It's, just, you know, it, it, yeah. it, how do you, do you, are you able to go back and critically look at it? What is structurally a good story? That's the thing. Structurally yeah, I, I, I know, I know. But don't you know when you're writing, them. you're like, you know, something has to happen to this character. They can't just keep doing this the whole time. You know, you just know things have to happen. You know, I mean, do you think about 
your readership at all? Or, or is it just like, nope, this is the story. Take it or leave it. I just, once the character comes, before, because for me, it's a character that always comes from nowhere. I get this character and I wouldn't sleep. I just keep seeing them over and over and over. And then finally I say, I've got to write about that character, which is what happened with A Dance for the Dead. Mm -hmm. because it was that prince, the dancing, the dancer prince that I kept seeing. I was going to write his story. Hmm. And I sat down to write about the prince and his dancing because I just kept seeing him. He was so happy. He was so joyful. He was so handsome and so lovely. And the joy he had in dancing and drinking palm wine. And I said, I'm going to write about this prince. I don't know what the story is going to be about, but I need to put him down. And then suddenly in comes a brother. I didn't reckon on him having a brother nothing and his brother just came in and his voice was as powerful and strong even drowning out almost drowning out the prince the dancing prince i loved and so, i resented him i really resented him <laughs> I, I felt he was bullying his way into huh. the story i didn't want to write about him that's so but so I, it's not like you were sitting there saying you know this guy should really have a brother that would really help the story you nope. have no intent it just all of a sudden it's it just there yeah I'm typing and suddenly I'm just seeing myself typing in the name, typing in his name and typing about him. And I'm saying, where is he coming oh from? Where is he? Why is the story becoming stronger? His story is against the prince. No, 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 I don't want you. It was a conflict. It was a big conflict for me to um, decide. And in the end, I realized, OK, I need to make my peace with him. He's clearly a bully. He wants to take over the story. He will be punished in that case. And that's why I decided, um, yeah. Uh, to to give him the downfall, yeah, because I just felt he was he was uh yeah invading my dancing prince, and wow. so we gave him the the punishment. He had to have the punishment, yeah. So and um, just going back to the possession thing, I, I picture you. So you're writing twenty hours, and I I just I picture you just like. <laughs> collapsing you know i mean if i wrote for two hours i would collapse at the end of it but so but you're so you're going through this almost this exorcism every yeah. time you write so do you do you enjoy it is it do you do you, do you like writing or is it something uh, that you it's just a calling that you're <laughs> that you're it's just who you are oh my gosh writing is everything that's why i say my my i say to my daughters my biggest fear in life is that I might die without completing half of the stories I have left halfway. I'm very erratic in my writing. That's why I say to you, when I get the possession, I start writing. So I've got, I can't count. I'm sure I've got at least 20 to 30 unfinished stories, oh. all in different stages. Uh-huh. It, it just comes, when it comes, I start writing, writing, put it all down, and it leaves me. I ignore it. Then another story comes, another character comes. Okay, right, right, right. Leave it, and it goes. And then another one comes. And it doesn't matter what voice comes. I've got quite a few short stories published under different names, not my name, because they are not African horror. Uh-huh, <laughs> they are right, different yeah. kinds. Yeah. Um, but whatever story comes, I will write, write, and wherever it stops, it stops. And it's... some of them get finished, others don't. So let me understand. So <laughs> when it comes to you, and, and you know you get possessed for say five hours, and and at the end of it, you have what you think is maybe like three quarters of a short story, three quarters of a novella. If it doesn't come again, that's as much as that story gets written. Yeah, I leave it and forget about it. Wow. Until one day, I could be sitting down and something triggers, and I remember, oh, I have that story. That happened to me. My agent said to me, um, "We need a story." a second novel uh, uh, for what one of the novels she was pitching. And when she said it, I just clicked. Ah, there was a story. There was a story. I started mm. writing. Yeah. So I went back into the file and I found it and I began writing and I completed it. It's a complete novel. My agent has it. Wow. It happens like that. When I'm asked to submit short stories or anything, or any submit, anything, I just go into the file and I would read up and say, okay, which one is pulling me? Which one is calling me? Which one do I think can be completed? And I start reading it from the beginning to remember what right. it was all about. Right, right. And if I'm reading it and it's not calling me, that's not the right one. Until I find the one that's huh. calling me, I'll so you complete don't ever, it. You don't ever go look at your uncompleted stories and say, I should really finish that one. It nah, doesn't work like never. that. 
never, no, never, <laughs> never. It's so fascinating. Yeah. So I'm just worried that I might die with, with tons and tons of uncompleted stories there. Just because when the voice comes, I only write up to where it stops. But that would still be a really interesting anthology, right? An anthology of all your incomplete short stories. <laughs> anthology of incomplete stories. That would be, I'll I need think somebody that would be, to complete it. I think that would be fascinating. I mean, unfortunately, you'd have to be dead for that to happen. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think anyone yeah. would let you get away with that while you were alive. But like, I think afterwards that would be, that would be a fast, sounds like something like, you know, you know, would be good to study in school. Like, Oh dear. Why oh dear, oh dear. The story? Yeah. It, it's just that, um, that's why when I studied at university and I, all the things they taught me, all the structure, all the plotting, I realized I was taught based on the Western Sure. standardized structure and writing and all the things african horror when i'm writing it it doesn't follow any of that it's right. free flow it's freestyle anything goes well especially so, if it's very I, kind of folklore-esque you know there's less maybe structure around that anyway it's not all, yeah if you read my book you'll find it's not all it's not all folklore you've got folk the influence of folklore you've got the influence you know of the, the standard you know the normal western commercial you know horror bits in it you've got all kinds of influences going on but you find that because of the unique culture and the people like you find in many many different regional you know genres um people have ways of telling their stories the way the japanese will tell is a different way from the way maybe a For latin sure. american would tell different from the way an african would tell we all have our different ways and we follow the different ways of writing which doesn't follow that standardized structured teaching you know format we were taught to follow as writers mm -hmm. and i found okay the, the, the going to university to do the masters it was good i made many great friends there <laughs> you know lifelong friends that are so dear to me and then um, you, you learn a few things about dialogue. You learn about pacing and things. Yeah. But at the end of the day, go with the way. I say to everybody, whatever format you want to write your story in, write totally. it. It's your story. Totally. Only you can tell your story. You right. Know? Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I, you know, I, I started writing out of the blue. I had zero background in writing. And I just one day I started writing. I didn't know anything. And, you know, I looked at a few books about writing and, but you ultimately have to just write a lot <laughs> and make a lot of mistakes and find like what you did, find your voice, your and, voice. Then, and then just hone it from there and just, and then kind of just go with your instinct, I, I think. Yeah. And, and, you know, of course you're going to be told, you know, once you start going through the publication process, which is difficult, you'll get that feedback to know if you need to rethink things, but yeah, I'm not a big believer in this is the way you write. You know, I don't believe in that at all. So. I love the word you used, instinct. Yeah, instinct. don't you think? There is nothing like writing with your instinct. Just be an instinctual writer. Just go, go right. with the flow because the characters coming to you, the voice is coming to you. Everything coming, it's all unique to you. And if you try to become regimented and say, no, let me sit down and let me write Michael. Uh, you'll be 29 years, you will right. be an office worker, you will wear a suit, you will have a best friend who will be working in Walmart. You will... <laughs> right. But it some people becomes... do. So, but some people yeah. write like that. And that's totally and that's fine. how they can write. Right. But not for me. And clearly not for you. You no. know, no, in fact, I'll be writing long scenes. And I'll, I'll kind of even hear my agents and my editor's voice going saying, you know, this is going to be a problem. But I'm like, I know, I know what do you, I can't help it. <laughs> and sure. I, I definitely will look at things methodically during editing, but during that first draft, it just kind of, it's just kind of, I, I got to get the story. Pour, out. Just pour out the story. Interesting. Exactly. Interesting. Well, well, speaking of storytelling, we're going to wrap up, but before we do, we're going to do a little, our, our little impromptu storytelling. Okay. No, you can't do that with your face. You can't. Okay. <laughs> I'm not one for. I said to myself, that's going to be a tricky one. Okay. No, it's, um, it's, it's fun and it's fast and it's, and it's, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's, it's sometimes it's very inspirational. And I feel like you and I have this kind of connection and I, I feel like we're going to flow <laughs> together in whatever story that we create. Uh, 
So I, I have three books that I'm going to have you choose one of them. And we're going to choose a random sentence from a random page. I'm going to read that sentence. And then that's the first sentence of like a two minute long short story. So I'll read that sentence. You give me a sentence or two. I'll do a sentence or two. And then I'll just call it quits after just a bit. Um, but I've got uh, From Below by uh, Darcy Coates. I think it's a, I think this is actually horror. I haven't read it yet. It's This is an arc. Um huh. And I have Dean Kuntz's Odd Thomas and Donna Tartt's The Little Friend. Um, I love the color of this book. This one. And I love the title, The Little Friend. Okay. You want to choose that one? Yes. Okay. So give me a page between one and 600. Three. Three. Yeah. No one has ever chosen such an early page. It's my lucky number. Oh, Okay. Uh, give me a sentence between one and say 10. Three. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh my God. This is, I'm going to pick another, I'm going to pick another page. These are like paragraph long sentences. Okay, here we go. I'm going to read this sentence. Cause this is a, this is kind of a creepy sentence and it's short. Uh, there should have been at the very least someone outside watching the baby. But there was no one except the person watching the baby was there, but invisible. It was an invisible presence looking down at the baby, speaking to the baby. The baby could see the presence. The baby looked at it, smiled at it, goggled, and waved his little arms at the presence. And suddenly, a knowing flowed between the presence and the baby. They knew, they understood. Wow. <laughs> A cloud came over casting a long shadow on the baby. The baby instinctively shivered and turned and started crawling away, crawling towards the pond in the backyard. And we could see the water. The water was still, but suddenly it stared as if there was something reaching out, grasping, calling, pulling. And as the baby drew closer to the pond, the baby stopped and the baby stopped crying. The baby smiled, turned round, and crawled back to the house. I'm going to call it there because that was beautiful. <laughs> See, I thought you were going to, I thought that baby was going into the water. It won't go into the water. Yeah. A, the baby had something to do. It, it, that's yeah. So, yeah, that's fascinating because, you know, what I visualized was as the, after the baby smiling, I pictured like all these people in the house like no, and nobody was looking outside. And I just pictured something starting to come out of the water. Uh, but you took it in a much nicer direction. <laughs> yeah, I won't let the baby drown because the baby has the mission. There's something happening. The, something has sent that baby. The baby uh, is, is now the, the carrier, the messenger. And uh, Right, because the, the baby's been transformed will, uh, by the, 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 the presence. Yes. yes. And we're not sure if it's a malevolent presence or a benign one. But the baby um, smiled, so that's one thing. Yes, the baby smiled. Wow. See, now this is going <laughs> to, this is, this is going to, you can add this to your incomplete stories. <laughs> and, yeah. and, then, and then 10 years from now, when you're, when your editor's asking for a story, you're like, oh yeah, there was I'll something about Carter. a baby. Yeah. <laughs> Go ask Kat about that baby. You can, re you can rewatch the episode and then it can become a novel. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> That was fun. You're good. You're good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And they, listen, congratulations on your re recent release. Uh, that's Dance for the Dead that just came out, right? That's got to be exciting. It is. You should read it. If you haven't read it, it's African horror again, and it's your ghost. I would love to read it. And everything. Awesome. Awesome. What a pleasure to talk to you. Dito, Kata. Dito. <laughs> I had a really good time, and uh, you you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. for Thank you very Thank much. Yeah. Take care. Bye, bye Bye. So that's it. That's my conversation with Nuzo Ono. Uh, that was great. She was fascinated. And I told you the storytelling was good. She just, uh, I was very happy just to sit back and listen to her because it was kind of, she was possessed. It was just flowing out. She had a great story and, and, and the baby ended up living. So that's really all that matters. Um, I did not find a website for 
Nuzo. Um, but if you Google her, you can uh, find multiple sites uh, where you can learn a lot more about her. And I encourage you to do that. She also seems to be very prolific on Twitter. Um, and again, her new book is A Dance for the Dead, uh, which was just released on November 1st of 2022. Um, and if you want to find out more about me, please just go to my website, carterwilson.com, and you can uh, check out my books, check out my appearances. Um, subscribe to my newsletter, all that good stuff. Or you can even contact me Just say, Hey, that would be nice. I'd like to hear from you guys. Um, that's it for now. You know, I, uh, I, 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 this was a fantastic episode and more fantastic episodes will be out soon. In the meantime, I really appreciate as always you listening to this or watching this, uh, and, uh, you know, happy holidays. This might come out after the holidays, but Hey, happy holidays. Take care. <laughs>